So I'd just like to say welcome to everybody this morning for our very, very first early bird session. Uh, we will consider potentially making a little later birds uh, for the next one, but we'll see how we go. As people get back into the new norm, it might still end up being another really good idea to keep it this early. So we're really excited about having Tracy Ward on today, who's a, um, a very experienced and qualified uh, mindset coach. Um, before we actually hand over to Tracy, I'm just going to go through a little bit about what's happening with BWA. And for those of you who, um, who are interested in becoming members, this is a really important uh, sort of outcome, uh, outline of what we're all about. So uh, welcome. Before we start, just like to acknowledge wherever we may be around Australia, we are gathered on Australian land where First Nations people lived, worked, danced, cared for and celebrated for over 60,000 years and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And we acknowledge our sisters in business, Indigenous sisters in business, and we support them in what they're achieving. So our BWA mission is where everyone is valued. Uh, we contribute to the greater good, demonstrating a new way to be the number one national collaborative community in Australia. And we're always focused on the success of women in business. And we do that through helping each other, achieving our goals and dreams, building a network of influence, creating opportunities to improve the visibility of business women in Australia. So who are we? You know, we get asked this quite often. Uh, as a collective, we really are um, a community that's shared more by our values than by our titles and roles. Uh, we're made up of business owners and entrepreneurs, directors, executives, managers, professionals, consultants. Uh, we've got quite a lot of women in our C-suite and women on boards, especially those in our uh, leadership and presenting um, teams. And we also invite emerging leaders and students to join us. So we really have quite a wide community. Uh, we've got about 10,000 subscribers to our e-news. We've got 2,500 LinkedIn group members. We've got thousands of, of people following us on Facebook. But we're really made up of um, sort of more intimate gatherings around Australia and now online where we can really get to know each other and build uh, sort of friendships. So we focus on five areas of development, leadership, business improvement, personal growth, influence and profile, and of course, connecting. And it's about real connecting. Uh, inclusion and diversity is a key value of what we do. Uh, all our events are made available uh, to anyone to come in and join and participate. You don't have to be a member of Business Women Australia to, to be a part of what we're doing. Uh, we're very much focused on courage and honesty, on collaboration. Uh, Open-mindedness is key in terms of our values. Uh, we're not a judgmental group. We're very open um, towards people, towards trying new things, and that sort of ties into that courage aspect as well. We're very much mindful and conscious in our caring approach to things and caring about people and about what's going on. And we try and bring, as a group, working towards bringing a positive uh, energy and an optimistic view of life. So our benefits that we say um, is a part of being our community, and of course the friendships and the connections that you make, but also we have a very busy schedule of great opportunities um, in our calendar. Uh, and when we go back to the new normal, we will be continuing with our online series um, and just reinstating our chapter events where there's uh, in-person networking and opportunities to get together. Knowledge sharing is the key to Business Women Australia. So we're very encouraging of our members to be uh, leading the shows, to be sharing the, uh, their knowledge through workshops, masterminds, through banters, through presentations, through articles in our um, publications and so on. It's very important. We have a lot of um, a lot of people coming to us and wanting to sell uh, through our channels. And my view and the view of all our members is that we're your mates, not your market. 
uh, we will actually work out, you know, for every event we work out, you know, how to market and increase the profile of business women, but we actually extend our marketing beyond our membership because this is really a collaborative group that's working together. We are, we're mates and uh, we get eyes and ears for each other. So referrals come from within the community because we keep an eye out and try and understand each other's businesses so that we can actually really um, be able to send work each way um, and identify opportunities, grants, whatever there might be that could be a benefit to um, another member. And that sort of, that's that generosity of spirit that underpins the group. So we have a LinkedIn group page. Anyone's welcome to join that. It's free to join. It's a place where I do send a lot of people to um, share what they're doing, to share great articles, opinions, uh, any views. It's sort of it's great. It's a great uh, it's a great sort of way for us to as a team to really monitor what the what's trending with women and what are the the issues that they're talking about, what are the things that they're doing. And to check in with those that are running events and seeing how they're going with them. Do they need a hand? What you know? Do they need a bit of help and support? We don't see other women's groups as competition. We see them as potential collaborators, and we try and help them achieve what they're doing because ultimately, it's all helping women. We have a company page. Uh, we have a directory listing on our website, and that's a great place to. Um, to uh, point anyone that you want to refer to another business women member. Uh, so if they're our members, they're the ones we really want to help out. Um, first point, if there's someone in that, that group that has an expertise like Bev, who's a book publisher uh, for independent book writers, you know, we would point people to Bev's profile and I'm often sharing those profile links to people that come to me and say, do you know anyone in? Um, and I really want to see our members and our leaders doing more of that. Uh, our Facebook page and our private Facebook community um, up and running, of course, our Twitter and our Instagram handles. And our most used hashtags are BWA events and BWA, BWA leaders are our two most used hashtags. Couldn't do any of what we do without sponsors and our partners. Um, uh, um, our leadership team are all volunteers in Business Women Australia. We have our own businesses, so it's a labour of love for us. We have some amazing contractors that work in the background and tick over all our marketing and, and setting up events and database management and all those things that are very vital to the operations of Business Women Australia, and they work under my guidance. Um, but without Catco Enterprises looking after our web, she's, um, Kathy's just redesigned and rebuilt the website from scratch. Um, our old website was very clunky and constantly overriding itself. So we're really excited about this. It's actually live and we're just tweaking it at the moment. Um, solo accounts, Donna Vincent does all our invoicing, manages our books, deals with our accountants, um, make sure that everything, all their money's in the right place and keep an eye on her app. Um, if you are a sole trader or self-employed, if you're a, a consultant, a coach, it is the easiest bookkeeping system. It's all do-it-yourself. Uh, it's an app and software. I've been using it for years um, as a strategy consultant and uh, all my contracting team members use it. So it spits out your BAS number and then I jump into my gov and put my BAS in there. I do my invoicing from there. Love it. Um, inspiration Source, Intact Teens, Platinum Mix, LG Accounting Solutions, Three Drops, Bright Business and Evolving Women in the Sunshine Coast. We're thinking very much about Cindy at the moment, who's our chapter leader at Sunshine Coast, um, going through chemo at the moment. So everything's on hold over there and our hearts, our thoughts and our prayers are with Cindy. Um, we'd love for you to join if you're not a member. We'd love for you to uh, look at sponsoring an event if you're an organisation that really wants to support what we're doing and has a value match. match. Um, we um, will always looking for more premium members to join if they've got a, a specialty or a bit of expertise that we haven't already got within our leadership team. Um, you can apply for that or have a chat to me if you want to become a premium member. What's on? We've got so much coming up. It's flat out. Um, 
Uh, since we've gone online, my life uh, has been more hectic than it was when there were just a few events here and there scattered around Australia <laughs> and I was flying, you know, and being able to really plan ahead. But this is great and I love where BWA is going. It's taken on a life of its own. So if you want to have a chat and a, uh, a bit of a wind down on Friday, I'm always online after work. Um, there's no agenda. It's a bit of fun. We always uh, have an hour just of um, meeting some new members quite often in there. So Friday after work, we call it Friday Freefall. Love to see you after work this week. You don't have to be a member to join us either. You can jump in and just see, have chat, ask other members what it's like. Just tell us if you've had a good week, a bad week, whatever. Next Tuesday, the wonderful Becky Sangster, who's a marketing strategist, an absolute guru, a beautiful lady, uh, facilitates our rapid brainstorming session around the table, limited in numbers. We've still got some spots for that if you are interested. Uh, and of course, the lovely Sonia Le Penna on the 14th of May next week, um, the second of her HR boardroom series, um, leading uh, through ambiguity. It's a deep dive. Um, I came away from the last session that she ran with some excellent frameworks around scenario planning that I've used with um, my clients and um, and it's been fantastic because um, really navigating particularly this, this time where things are changing every week uh, is a real challenge for leaders. Uh, courageous conversations with Vida Carlino. If you haven't experienced any work with Vida, I, I would very recommend it. Um, Vida actually runs circles uh, for women. She does a lot of circle work for men and for women. And uh, there's in interesting parameters around how those circle conversations work. And, and we're using this as a way of bringing those, those types of uh, ways of being and holding space into more of a corporate and professional environment by using Vida to do these courageous conversations because they are a new way of doing things. Um, our theme for this one is quick fixes and need for speed and um, we'd love for you to come and experience it. We're, we're, not, we're not all brilliant at, at uh, achieving those parameters. A lot of it's around not fixing, not it's just around holding space and listening, no cross-talking, all this sort of stuff. And we're still, we, as consultants and advisors, it's one of the hardest things to learn to do is not to advise and consult. I find that really hard. So that's what I love about Vida's, um, her, her skill sets that she's bringing in to, uh, for us. You know, it's really amazing. Uh, our next Early Birds, of course, is 4th of June. Hold this space. It's probably going to be at the same time for this one, uh, but I will let you know. I'll get some more feedback. Um, we don't really want them to be huge, big events anyway, these ones, because we want the opportunity for everyone to um, get involved in the conversation. So I will have a, um, a, a chat to some of those who had said they were going to make it and to see if the, if the time is the problem, if the time's the problem, we might push it out a bit. If it's not, we will stick with it, because I do like the idea of having an early birds session, and I don't have to lead it. If I'm still racing into law firms, I'm sure one of my other leaders would be happy to host and play BWA uh, introducer. So if you aren't a member, we'd love you to join. A classic membership is only 299 a month. If you are interested in the premium membership, have a chat to me about what you would bring to the table in terms of your expertise. We put a lot of effort into the background and the planning, and we love a contribution investment into the community from our premiums. They pay more to work harder. It's, a, it's an interesting model, but it seems to work. And I'm going to hand over to Tracy. I'm really excited about this. When Tracy pitched to me the idea of running a series of monthly sort of mindset topics, uh, for me, it was a blessing in disguise because obviously I'm not brilliant at setting boundaries because this is something that I've always wanted to invest in is is really understanding a lot of the mindset around success is going to help me. So for that purpose and that purpose only, I am so excited. If it helps anyone else too in terms of what they're doing, that's a bonus. So thank you, Tracy. I'm really excited. I'm going to stop sharing it so you can start. Okay, great. Brilliant. Let's get this happening. Okay, lovely. Can everybody see my screen with the beautiful yep. flower? Beautiful. Okay. Wonderful. Well, welcome to really, we've got, we've got an hour's conversation to talk about 
healthy boundaries and and this is really about giving you some space to breathe and um, what I would love you to do is firstly uh, whether or not you're you're listening to this live or if you're listening to the recording get a pen and paper I don't want this to be a talk fest I actually want you to do some work because I want you to actually change some things in your life so you need i'm going old school i know it sounds very boring pen and paper but i want you to get a pen and paper brilliant pen. love your work and and for those that are online i'd love you to interject with comments um send me a chat if i miss the chat take your mic off off mute and interrupt because i don't want this to me just just doing the talk fest but as Bev said, we are recording this. So I'm more than happy to stay on the line afterwards. And if you've got more uh, personal questions that you just want to workshop, then we can have a chat um, then. So this is what we're going to be covering today. Really, we're covering where you're at now. And this is about being real with yourself. Being what I call honestly resilient. Resilience is a, a word that I hear a lot in the workplace and I feel it often translates into the workplace of just putting up with more work. And I want, want to talk about being honestly resilient, um, showing you how you can carve out a bucket more um, time for you and why that's important. And then the art of DSD, which is delegating, simplifying, and dumping, which what I know to be true, women, women say to me, um, they always go, oh yeah, I know that, Tracy, I know, yeah, I know how to delegate, yeah, I understand we should simplify tasks, uh, yeah, I know things can be dumped, and yet when I coach them, what they know and what they do is very different. And that's often around mindset. So I want to start off today and give you the theory around DSD, give you some tools to really help you become masters of delegating. But then in the session in June, we will be saying, how did you go? And then exploring your conditioning and, um, and your blockers that get in the way of you being real masters here. So with all of these concepts none of this is rocket science it's all straightforward but it's straightforward and yet we as women often avoid doing it so it's time it really is time to be honest with yourself um i was talking for those um who i'm just going to move this back to that side because it works better there i think um all of this information in all of the series that I'm working with you is going to appear in the book that is coming soon, Being Perfectly Imperfect. It's going to be about 12 bucks. So this isn't a big sell to PWA for me to make a fortune, but there are great tips of things because I've been coaching women for about 20 years and I find I say the same thing over and over again. And so a friend of mine said, you should put it in a book. And I was saying to Bev, I had, you know, a complete fit of going, me, you know, if my English teacher was here, he'd be going, no. Um, but thankfully with beautiful editors, I think they've strung all my ideas together in something that's really coherent. So that's just something that you can reference and I'll let you know at the end if you're interested in joining me on the book launch, which sadly, will probably still have to be a virtual champagne thing. So I don't know, somehow we'll work that out. So where are you at now in terms of if you're thinking about your life, if you are being honest with yourself, where, where are you at? Now, firstly, are you juggling too many things? You know, if this spinning plate, do you, do you feel you're getting through the day and going, oh, I just, I just managed to get, <laughs> keep all the plates. This is about you being honest. You don't need to do share, but you know, are you, are you juggling two things? Would others say that you're juggling two things? 
What's the challenge like in working from home? I know WA might be changing, but how is this working for you or, or, or is it not? Um, how are your stress levels with that? Um, what are your financial concerns? Um, you know, this, um, with COVID, it's really changed a lot of our business models. And for some of us, we've got to reinvent things. For some of us, maybe you're, you're flying. Um, and for others, there's a lot of uncertainty, which again can cause us stress. So I want you to think how you're going there. Um, or is it a question of it's all of the above? So I want you to think, um, uh, you know, think about how, how you actually feel like you're going at the moment and how you would mark yourself out of 10. So if you're, if you're, um, if we're going zero is, um, I'm done, you know, I'm just done. And 10 is, I'm brilliant. Um, what mark would you give yourself? Now, the psychologist would say, if, if you're in what I would call the brilliant or healthy or performing well, you would be giving yourself an eight or above. So for any of you that have given yourself below eight, a seven, a six, a five, four, three, two, one, then we, we need, you know, we need to talk. You need to have a good conversation with yourself about how you're actually going. And this, this is one of the most important self-compassion techniques is acknowledging how you are actually feeling, acknowledging where you rate yourself now. It's not a time to put your head in the sand. Now, I've experienced this with all of this. I've probably done everything wrong to learn, found the tool to get me out, to get it right. Um, I divorced about six years ago, an amicable divorce, really happy, still get on with my ex-husband. You can divorce amicably, and you can divorce for about $800. You don't need to go through the court. So, you know, that to me in itself is an achievement. But after that, like many women, when you divorce, financially, we were running two homes in Sydney. Now, for any of you who are in Sydney and you know Sydney rents, that's really expensive. And I just felt I was working to pay the rent, working to pay the rent. A friend of mine put me in touch with this investment group. And um, it seemed like it made really good sense. And I... Um, decided to be sensible and make three different investments so diversify. Roll on about a year and a half later, I discovered the group was a band of crooks and I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it was just shocking how backwards I went. But what was really interesting I wasn't acknowledging where I was. And it was like I was metaphorically sliding down a well and I'm clinging on with my fingertips. But I'm saying to everybody and I'm saying to myself, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm still going out for friends' birthdays. I'm still going to the gym because it's really important to exercise. Um, but inside, I was an absolute walking zombie. And when I finally, and I remember the tipping point, it was when my private detective, yes, I had a private detective on speed dial, told me that they couldn't track these guys down and the chances of me getting my money back was zero. I just let go from trying to hold on to the side of the well and I just plummeted down to the bottom. And I... Finally, I acknowledged to myself I was not okay. And when I did that, I felt so much better. I wasn't using this energy trying to hold up. So I let myself crush down to the bottom of the well and I made, if you like, the bottom of my well comfy. 
put some virtual cushions down there um, and I hibernated a bit like we're doing now really on the sofa with some faux furs watching Netflix and my dogs but then because I acknowledged to myself I wasn't okay it was then much easier for me to get help so I went to my GP she said do your friends know no so she said tell your friends and it was amazing then but that process of acknowledging, suddenly I started to come back up. So don't underestimate the power of sitting with yourself and going, how am I really? And acknowledging that it is such a powerful technique. And you'll understand as we go through why this is so important. Now, You've worked out where you are on a scale of one to 10. And if you're, if you're eight, nine or 10, brilliant. Give me some tips you might be able to add to the webinar. Fantastic. Um, because I'm always open to learning. But if you're anything below, then we need to do some work. And, and I'm talking about this being honestly resilient, which all comes down to being self-compassionate. Self-compassion is honest resilience. And what the re research has found is Kristen Neff, who is the self-compassion queen, really, she's done so much research in this area. Instead of it being a weakness, researchers are discovering that self-compassion is one of the most powerful sources we have at our fingertips. So when you practice self-compassion, so one of the techniques of practicing self-compassion is acknowledging where you are, um, you will actually find you'll have more energy, you'll have find it easier to care for others, you have greater compassion for others. Um, it is even being shown it reduces the symptoms of menopause, which can I just say going through it at the moment, it, that is a bonus, an absolute bonus for the more mature women on the lie. Do some self-compassion because I tell you, it actually really changes how you are feeling. So this is really important for us. The trouble is, and we'll come on to this in June, People equate self-compassion with weakness or self-compassion with selfishness, and it's not. So being self-compassion, what are the sorts of things that you could be doing to be self-compassion? Well, it's about you putting your oxygen mask on first before others. And, and Michelle Obama said, we should put ourselves further up our to-do list. Now, I think that's nice. I actually think there's one better. We should be the top of our to-do list. Because if we don't put ourselves at the top of our to-do list, who is? And this is the thing with women. We are looking after everybody else. But there is nobody else. I mean, hey, some of you might be really lucky who's got a partner that goes, my priority is, is my wife. But that's rarely. I know, I know. I mean, where are they? Um, so it's important for us. We should be the priority of ourselves, of our lives. We should be at the top of our priority list. So what we are going to do today, I'm going to show you by putting yourself at the top of your to-do list, how you can actually re reduce your to-do list and then carve out time for you. Now, with that carving out time, you can use that as recovery time. Now, use a phrase that works for you. Recovery stage, recharge period, space to think, time for me. Elite athletes, the study now is uh, it's, oh, so concrete. All elite sports people have recovery time. They do not exercise seven days a week. 
They have lots of recovery time and that has been proven to increase their performance. So if it's good enough for elite athletes, it's absolutely vital. We as women who are juggling a thousand and one things that we have recovery time. I say to any elite athlete, try and do what a working woman with two children and two dogs do. And I tell you, they would fall in a heap. Okay. So with this recovery time, what are the sorts of things that you should be doing to recharge your internal batteries? Well, these are the sorts of things. So the start of the day, you could read something inspiring. Have a meditation just sit i went on a buddhist retreat um last year which is a story in itself but maybe for one of your friday wine o'clock stories because it's a funny story but at the buddhist retreat we didn't start until nine o'clock in the morning before then it was a no conversation time. Now I'm an extrovert, I love to chat. So it was like, oh my gosh, I can't talk till nine o'clock. But what was really lovely, it meant you got up, you got breakfast, and then we're in a bush area and I just sit with my cup of tea and look at the trees and the birds. And it was magical. What we tend to do as women that go, right, half six, seven o'clock, the alarm goes off, dive into the shower, call the kids, you know, get them out of bed, start getting breakfast, checking your phone for emails, and it's all full on. So early morning, just actually setting those intentions and allocating time for yourself during your day, prioritizing your day. I'll just give you some tips at the end because... Everybody goes, oh yeah, I know how to do that. I know how to do it, but they're not doing it. Having set times for emails, taking breaks, going outside, getting fresh air. I am so grateful the beaches are open again in Sydney. So I've had some amazing swims. The sea is so, so crystal clear at the moment. Um, do something fun. You are allowed as a woman to do something fun. When I say to women, what would you like to do that's fun? A lot of them go, oh, I don't know. Because they're so busy being a taxi service for their kids or working or doing kids sport that they've forgotten what, what fun is. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, no technology for two hours before sleep time. Try that. You know, no technology in the bedroom. Read something fiction. I am loving at the moment. I'm reading the tootiest fiction books. I'm not going to share the titles. It's too embarrassing. But I'm, I've been in, in many book clubs and we often read heavy duty stuff, you know, about the plight of women in Africa. And I mean, it's brilliant, but it's exhausting reading that before I'm going to bed. It, my, my mind is still going. What should I be doing to help these women? So now I'm reading <laughs> taught, taught fiction and it's brilliant. I'm sleeping so much better. And then here's one of the things that I would really love all of you to do. Have days with no work and no technology. Now that sounds straightforward, but I know what it's particularly hard when it's your business. It's really hard to switch off, but you need to um, make that decision that actually you're going to give yourself some time out. And what's really fascinating with clients when I say this and they uh, do this, they're really surprised that the wall, you know, the walls didn't collapse just because they didn't have their phone on with them for the day. And, and to do things like go out without your phone, it's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. You are so mentally present with the day. So for the, for the women that are on the call, out of those suggestions for recharging, just take your um, thing off mute so we won't worry with the chat. But what's one of those things that you think, oh, that would be really nice to try? I like the idea of a day with no um, 
no work and no tech. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, they go, they go perfectly together. Yeah. Yes. Anyone else? I know my husband would be very excited if I went out with him without the phone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that should yes. be truly present to Simon. He's going to love that idea. Yeah. Um, you, you know, do that. It's true. Because if you think about it, I mean, would you tolerate my kids? I've got two teenagers. They're 19 and 17. And they know dinner time, do not bring the phone to the table. Yeah, we've got the same rule. But, but the thing is, so we have the rule with our kids, but then we don't practice it. Well, that's it. Simon and I will go down the beach and, and all the way to the beach, he'll be wanting to point out things. And I'm using that time in the car to be doing so, usually promoting events on LinkedIn, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and, you know, because I said, oh, it's sort of like, it's sort of wasted time. I'm not having to do something. And then by the time we get to the beach, and now I've put my phone un under the under the um, mat in the car, so I don't take it down the beach. But he's already a little bit cranky because he's yeah. enjoy he's yeah. wanting to yeah. point out people's gardens and show me what's happening with that. And and I'm annoyed with him because he's interrupting me from getting this little job done. <laughs> it's classic. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, that's something I think that will be a great goal. What I'd like everybody, whether you're listening or you're on the call, pick one thing and set it. Do you know what? I'm going to have a go at doing this. I'm going to show you how to save you a bucket load of time so you don't have to be promoting things on LinkedIn when you're in the car, Lynn, because that's excessive. That's excessive. And I get why, I get why your husband will be annoyed. It's like, what's the point in going away with you? Because I'm, 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 you're not here. You're not mentally here. So I'd love everybody to look at this list and just pick one. Um, I'd love you to do all of them. But these are just great suggestions to help you recharge. Because if you remember, if we are recharging our batteries, we actually have more energy. So you will do more. This isn't, this isn't going to damage your productivity. It's going to increase your productivity. Um, oh, I just lost my mouse. Where is it? Yeah. Okay. So what I want you to do, I want you to pick either your work life or your home life. What's stressing you the most? I know at the moment they're doing this, but... The techniques that I'm going to go through of delegating, simplifying and dumping, I actually want you to do in your work life and in your personal life. But to do them at the same time is typically overwhelming. So I'd like you to pick one that you're going to start working on in this webinar so you get an idea of what we're actually doing. So this is the technique. We're going to look at the tasks that you do. So either the tasks that you do at work or the tasks that you do at home. And of those tasks, we're going to see which of these tasks can you delegate? Which of these tasks can you simplify? So saving your time again. And which of these tasks can you dump? So you're not going to do at all. Sounds straightforward so far? Yes, I, I love Lynn, you're nodding, and, and I, I just owe to hear what's going on in your, in your head. It'd be interesting. I'll see if any of what's going on in your head comes up on the next slide. So when I talk about being um, falsely resilient, um, this is where what I see people at work, they're going, yeah, I'm resilient. I can take on more work. I'm fine. But, you know, whenever anybody says I'm fine, it means that they are not fine. It means the exact opposite. Watch that word. It is just fascinating. Um, it doesn't mean I want to move this out. Oh, so here, if you see, these are some of the objections women give to me when I say, okay, I want you to delegate simplify or dump they'll go a if they're you know working for themselves or they're living at their own home they'll go i've got no one to delegate delegate to all of these tasks need to be done 
done and they need to be done today. Everything must be done today. I hear that a lot. Um, or I'm the only one that can do this task is a classic one. I'm the one with the expertise, Tracy. I'm, I, you know, I can't delegate this. Um, and besides which, these tasks must be done in a certain way. Or we do the tasks of others because we're fearful that they will fail if we don't. So we want to help them out because we care. Or if we don't do everything really quickly to the highest standard, then, then my standards are slipping and people will see it as a sign that I'm not coping. You know, my clients will interpret a certain way or my family will implode. Yeah. Do any of these sound vaguely familiar? Yes? Right. Good. I'm glad we're, I'm glad I'm tapping in to your thought process. Well, let me tell you, these are all stories that you are telling yourself. I can tell you now, none of them are true. So when we go on to the next one, I'm going to talk you through the theory here, but the next webinar in June, which is about blockers and conditioning, a lot of these come from our conditioning and they come from beliefs that we're formed. They're often, they're often beliefs that we've inherited Heritage from our dear mothers. The book that I wrote is totally motivated by the fact I had a, oh, such a beautiful mother who did everything for everybody, nothing for herself. She was continually tired. She was stressed about money and work and I was constantly stressed about her. It wasn't good for her and it wasn't good for me. And it's about going no, we need to break this conditioning. So I get that you will be saying all of this, um, that you're fine and you need to do all of these tasks and they have to be done today, but I really want to, to challenge you and your thought process on that. So Warren Bar Buffett, if you want to be successful, Listen to what Warren Buffett, who has to be one of the most successful people on this planet. Really successful people say no to almost everything because it doesn't fit their priority. Yeah, because they are, they put themselves at the top of their to-do list. Whereas women say yes to all sorts of things because they're putting everybody else at the top of their priority list. So, you know, if you want a quote to stick on your bathroom mirror, this is a really good one. Really successful people say no to almost everything. Okay. All right. A great way to think about where you are how you rated yourself out of 10 and you know, oh, I'm doing too much. I know I'm stretched. I know I'm not having a quality life. Um, think about what would a dear friend advise you? How would a dear friend, somebody who knows you really well, if you were to say, you know, maybe after this webinar, you were to say, do you know what? I went on this webinar. <sighs> I don't know, I think I'm maybe overworking and I don't have any time for me, but I just don't think I can. I can't, I can't change, I've just got too much on. What would that dear friend say to you? And the reality of it is, is your, your dear friend would probably say things like, hang on, I'm just moving to see, okay. So um, your dear friend would probably say things like, do you know what, um, why don't you just try meditating? Or why don't you take some time out for your day? How about lunchtime, why don't you go for a walk? Get some sunshine, you know, or read some trashy novels so you stop thinking about um, work. I am sure any dear friend or family member that loves you and has your best interests at heart would say, give yourself a break, you deserve it. Okay? 
So I want you to understand if you are doing what I feel a lot of women are, um, do, which what was I was doing, when I was slipping down that well, and I'm going, I'm fine, I'm fine. Yeah, you know, I was still out socializing, you know, because it was scheduled in my diary. Everything was still happening. It's being very falsely resilient. And, and to be honestly resilient is, is about being honest with yourself. So, has everybody heard, I want to see by a nod, has everybody heard, treat others how you would like them to treat you? Everybody heard of that phrase? Yeah? Right, forget that one, because you already know it, you've known it for years, forget it. I want you to have this, this is another great phrase that you can have on your bathroom mirror. Treat yourself how you treat others because you care for others. You look after others, you nurture others, you help and support others. So all that beautiful love and care, flip it back, yeah? It's really important to flip it back. And one of the things and again, what often comes up when I say this to women, and one of the first things, and again, this comes back to conditioning, but go, oh, but Tracy, that just seems like I'm being so selfish. And I just want to talk, if you imagine a spectrum and we've got selfish here and we've got selfless here, and women have been conditioned, you know, I know I was from a child of, you know, share your toys, give to this, support this. You know, my mother was a master of it. We're, we're encouraged to be selfless. Yeah, and we see selfish as bad. What I want you to see, either end of this is not good. Sure, I don't want you to be an extremely selfish person. That's, that's not good good for the planet, it's not good karma, it's not gonna bring good energy back to you. But when you are completely selfless, you lose yourself, you disappear. So where you need to be is in the middle. Okay, so now we know we need to treat ourselves well. We know that any friend um, or family member that loves us would say, Give yourself a break. You deserve it. So I'm going to show you how we can save ourselves time. Because you need some time in your day so that you can comfortably relax. So going back, I said, do you want to pick your home or your work? Um, choose one. I don't mind which. I'm going to do a home example because I think it just, it's an example that most women will relate to. I know our work can be slightly different, but pick one because I'd like us to work on that particular task. So we're going to delegate, simplify and dump tasks. So the first thing that I want you to do, and I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes. I'm going to give you two minutes Pick either the work or home, and I just want you to list, just like I've done on the slide, tasks that you're currently doing. So just think about what have you got on your to-do list. Do not overthink this. All the tasks, big and small, that you've got to do today, think about what you did yesterday. Anything from you know feeding the cat to clearing out the garage, it doesn't matter, but I want you to write, I'm just going to give you two minutes, write all the tasks that you, you're doing or you've done this week.
Okay, now what I'd love you to do after the webinar, I, I'd love you to do this fully. So in other words, as I say, you're going to pick either work or home and go through every single task that you do. Now, just compiling this task list might take several days. And, and what I suggest you do, you spend the first couple of days just writing out the task list. Just observe yourself, even just observe yourself for a week with all the things that you are doing. So you've got a really good task list. Um, what I find when I coach women, uh, first time they do this, they miss a lot of tasks off because they're doing them on automatic pilot. They're just not realizing that they're doing it. So this is why I say you need to build on this task. But start with either work or home and then and do the exercise and then go into the other. So if we look at my example, I base this on a fictitious family. We've got um, Sarah, uh, she's married to David and she's got two children, Josh and Tess, who are teenagers, young teenagers. So if I just look at some of the tasks that Sarah has, there's, there's shopping, cleaning, a bit of baking and present shopping. There's a bucket load of um, cooking for Sarah, you know, ironing, putting away clothes in the garden. Okay, so just some basic home tasks. So Sarah's gone through the list and she's decided that some of these tasks can be delegated and some of these can be simplified and some of them can be dumped. And she's decided to who? So I'm just going to take you through this so that you can see what I'm doing. So the shop at Aldi, now she was going twice a week. And there's the, you know, driving in, finding a park, walk to the shop, go around, load the stuff back. Um, she realised if she were to um, just go once a week, that would save her a lot of time. So just buy bigger, clear out. We all have, well, say we all have. Maybe it's just me. But we all have stuff in our fridge and our freezer that we don't eat, but there's no room to put more stuff in. So clear that stuff out so you can buy a bigger shop, for example. So she's decided that she could do that. Or, of course, she could shop online. Cleaning the bathroom. I'm a big fan of family members participating in household chores. So Josh, her son, is now responsible for cleaning the bathroom. Uh, Jess, her daughter, is going to clean the kitchen. Um, there's a lot of shoulds. Mother-in-law's birthdays come in. She felt she should bake her mother-in-law a cake. No, buy one, I say. Uh, there needs to be a present for her mother-in-law. Well, I suggest her husband, it's his mother, he should buy the present. So that's being delegated. Saturday night dinner is Uber Eats or menu log. Yeah, because it's Saturday night. But the other meals are going to be shared around the family. Now, I did this exactly with my family. So um, David is cooking Sunday. I'm cooking Monday. I've decided I'm simplifying it. Women, I don't know watch too many cooking shows or read too many magazines. You can make a meal in 10 minutes. You know, you buy a cooked chicken, you know, and cook up some veggies or throw some salad and a crusty bread. In 10 minutes, it's done with very little washing up. And that's still a nutritious meal. So it can be simplified, which will save you time. So the kids are cooking and then maybe Sarah goes, look, I like on Friday night, I like cooking. So I'm going to make a fancy meal Friday night. Ironing, um, you'll notice in the book, my mother used to love ironing. Look, if you love ironing, iron away. Personally, 
Um, well, actually, I don't own an iron. So that explains how passionate I am about not ironing. But Sarah has decided to not iron the sheets or pillows, which she reckons will save time. Uh, she's no longer folding and putting away clothes. Why are you doing that for other people? It's their job. If they can't be bothered to get it out of the laundry, their problem. Um, weeding the garden, mowing the lawn, and cutting the hedges, she's going to get a student to pay her. Does all of that make logical sense? Does that seem fair enough? Yeah? All right. Those, those are the times that I've estimated that Sarah will save in a week, which is six hours and 15 minutes. Six hours and 15 minutes, she has saved. Now, what's really important with this time that you have saved is you do not do more work because that negates what you're doing. What you do is you actually utilize the six hours and 15 minutes that you have reclaimed wisely doing something that you know will be really good for you to do. Like Lynn, going on a lovely drive to the beach with your husband where you chat to him all the way and he goes, gee, you're in a good mood today. When you've got an extra six hours and 15 minutes a week and this is I've only just started on this. I haven't even gone into the work. You have the time to do this. So, given the fact that we know we can save ourselves a lot of time, what I want to do is really talk about, well, actually, no, sorry, before we do that, I want you to go back. Can you go back to your list? I'm going to put the kettle on, so I'm going to give you another two minutes. What I want you to do, I want you to go back to your list and look at the list as I've done here and see which of these tasks you can delegate, simplify, or dump. So another, just a couple of minutes, I'm gonna grab a cup of tea. Okay, Lynn, how have you gone? Well, I can definitely delegate more. Right. I don't need to be doing all these things myself. I've got right. perfectly good people. It's, it's my lack of planning and organisation. When I don't block out those times for planning and delegation, which I used to do on a Monday, I used to keep my Mondays very free to... Del, you know, go through the week in terms of what new projects have come up and use Asana and assign it and be really on top of everything. 
and I've let that get out of control. And I've and so I'm finding I'm doing things that I've failed to delegate to someone yeah. that is perfectly capable and probably, in fact, better at it. And I'm ripping them off because it's work that they would be paid to do. Yeah. So, so how um, many, just yeah, you, very you interesting. Spent two, you spent about two minutes on this task. Approximately how many hours would you save if you were to delegate? Well, just I was just working out that and I reckon I could probably save about eight hours across all the different things that I've identified who I can delegate things to and I've, I reckon I've saved myself eight hours um, and that would be eight hours that's chipping into my home time that's work-related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is and this is you just spending two minutes on the task. I oh, know it's just I'm I'm just looking at it going I'm such a deal. <laughs> <laughs> but we all do this and we we do it. Tasks magnetically come to us, and because we care and because we're capable, we do them. Yeah. So um. But I just, I just want you to think, if you can save eight hours there, imagine if you were to do this task properly and then do the same at home. Your life would be totally different. You'd have well, so yeah, time. I know. That's, um, it's, I love the Warren Buffett quote that you had, you know, because I always, I always tease my husband because he's a no man. Yep. And I'm a yes girl. And um, Oh, he loves being married to you then, doesn't he? Because <laughs> Perfect, he, he right? He doesn't want to do the task. He goes, hey, I'm not going to do it, but am I married to the woman that will? <laughs> Classy, hey? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That Warren Buffett quote needs to go up. It's going on the fridge today. Good. So with whatever time you have what i'd like you to do now is to actually put in your diary something that you are going to do with that time so say for example then you've discovered you've got eight hours so um i want to be radical and say um sun well sunday mother's day no technology and no work A little bit of technology, still got to FaceTime me. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, a little bit, as long as it's social, you're allowed. Um, but, but I really want you to put that time in the diary because what's important and what I find when I coach women is they go through this. They are blown away with the amount of time they can save. But knowing that and doing that are two different things. So you have to be honestly resilient with yourself, which is be honest and go, I know I shouldn't be doing this task. So therefore, I'm actually going to carry through with it. Now, um, in terms of the art of delegating, simplifying and dumping, I want to give some tips to help you because particularly delegating a lot of women struggle with delegating so i just want to give you some pointers here on on how to be smarter at delegating just um with those of you that are on the line can i just see with a hand who's a perfectionist okay so we've got two sort of perfectionists um perfectionists find it very difficult um, but I'm going to take you through these, t these things so that you understand if you've delegated a task, how to make sure it stays with that person and doesn't bounce back. Because anything that you delegate, what often happens, people go, oh, yes, I've delegated it. So, Lynn, you might have found that you've delegated something today, inspired from my webinar. And then somebody asks you a question tomorrow about the task and you find yourself going, oh, yes, look, I'll just do it. And it's just bounced back. So we need to make sure that we avoid doing that. So I'm just going to go through these tips to help you um, make sure that you delegate well so the task stays with the person. 
So the first thing is about having the right mindset, understanding that delegation is a win-win. It's good for you and it's good for them. Now, when I delegated the task of cooking one meal a week um, in my family, my son was 11 uh, and my daughter was 10. So they each had to cook a meal a week uh, uh, and, as, and I had to cook a meal. And then my husband had to meal. So that's, that's four. And then we'd eat out once and then no, I would do two more. So I was doing, still doing the lion's share. I was cooking three meals a week. But then the other meals were being delegated out. And I saw it as a win because they were learning a skill. And I saw it as a win for me is because I wasn't feeling like a servant. And what I say a lot to women, and I say it a lot in the book, and I say, I've said it a lot to my children, I am their mother, not their servant. And you need to be really clear on that. So you need to see that actually delegating to somebody else is actually in, empowering them. And it's also being kind to you. So you've got to have the right mindset. Now, you need to let them know what you want them to do because people are not telepathic. I love this photo. He thinks he's getting a present. Well, he is. It's the instruction manuals for all the appliances in the house, you know, like the washing machine, the dishwasher, the dryer, you know, the stove top, the microwave, all the instructions for everything including where is the vacuum cleaner. I've just recently moved into a new apartment and my son is living with me at the moment. He's just moved in during lockdown and he shot himself in the foot the other day because we've been here, well, I don't know, two months. And he said, um, mum, where's the vacuum cleaner? And he went, it's awkward, isn't it? He goes, the fact that I don't know. And I said, it's very awkward, you know? So... You need to, if you want somebody to do a task, you need to let them know. Don't assume they will, they will do it. And I see this a lot in, um, by the way, I do not do couples counseling. I'm so not that type of person. Doesn't work for me. But so often when I'm coaching somebody and they'll say, oh, my husband just doesn't clean. And I go, well, have you let him know that you want him to do that? Because I can tell you, just like Lynn, as you were saying, your husband, and I'm sure he's lovely, I haven't met him, but he's a no man. Men are very good at this. He is going to say no to everything in the house until it's explicitly clear, you know? So you need to let people know what you want them to do. Be clear, spell it out. The next thing is you need to explain the why. And we, we tend to miss this because we assume, we assume they get the why. And this happened to me at Christmas. And um, we had um, a big family. Well, no, that's ironic really, because my family sadly is so small, but we had um, my, my kids and their partners and, my partner and my ex-husband's partner, we really are one of these weird blended sort of families. We had a, a Christmas, uh, a pre-Christmas dinner because my son was going to be away at Christmas. And I let my son know that I wanted him, we had seafood, would he put the seafood scraps in the bin? Now where my headspace was going, was because then the entire kitchen bin contents can be taken to the outside bin because the bin collection is the following morning, right? But I didn't explain the, why it was important to put in the bin. So my son put the seafood scraps in the kitchen bin and we all went to bed. It was such a fun night. It was lovely. The next morning... It was a really hot night. The kitchen stank. And it was, you know, I woke up going, oh, what is that smell? 
And so the conversation in the morning went a bit like this. I went, why didn't you put the stuff in the bin? And my son said, I did put the stuff in the bin. And the problem was I hadn't explained why it needed to go in the outside bin because it was going to be a hot night and seafood stinks. When you, when you explain the why, people are more likely to do your task that you want. This applies at work or at home. They're more likely to do the task that you want um, and they're more likely to do it in the way that you want. Like with, with my ex-husband, he was a very, he's a very detailed person and I'm not. And I'm known for leaving cupboards open and doors and drawers open. And he kept on going on about closing the washing machine door front loader. And I just thought, oh, you're being such a nerd. You know, can't we, you know, why should it matter? Until eventually he said to me, at the time we had young toddlers, he said, look, I'm really worried if one of the kids goes into the laundry, if they close the door on their fingers, that's going to be really nasty. Got it. Kept it closed while the kids were young. It was really easy to do. But before, I just thought he was being petty. Yeah. So if you explain the why, people will see you as being a lot more reasonable and are more likely to do the task the way you want them to do it. Okay, positive and negative reinforcement. So this is all about encouraging people to do what we want them to do. So we've all heard in the, the carrot and stick and, and, you know, do understand our phones. We have no idea how often we are being manipulated by our phones. If you look at any of the apps on your phone, when you see, I play words with friends and it's got my little red dot with the number in saying, oh, there's two games. That's a positive reward. A lot of social media is all designed with positive reinforcement to make us stay on longer. For example, if you're looking at Facebook, you never get to the bottom of pages. It just always keeps you there. Other feeds, it's been very cleverly designed. The point is, we as humans can influence how other people behave. But because we don't think about it, we often give out the wrong, uh, we encourage the wrong behavior. So positive reinforcement is, is things like praise, words of thanks, appreciation. Really, really powerful. Most people, when I say, when was the last time somebody said, thank you for a job well done, I really appreciate what you do. They go, hmm, can't remember. We are starved of appreciation. So if you give, if you are generous with appreciation, people are likely to stay on the task in hand. With my son moving um, into my apartment, I've been, I've been really full on with this because we've had a break for a bit. He was being independent and he's come back and I'm going, <laughs> mate, don't think you're going back into slipping into five-year-old mode. Consider us more as flatmates. So I've explained, I explained in the kitchen because I live near the beach, I've said, kitchen, I said, I don't want to clear your crap up, just like you don't want to clear mine up. Um, make sure you wipe down the benches, particularly at the end of the night, if it's any of your stuff, because we don't want to encourage cockroaches. The why, right? Um, he, he's been doing that, and several times, uh, and once in particular, I gave him a big hug. And I went, mate, I love how you've grown into this beautiful young man. I love how the kitchen is. Positive reinforcement. For us to be good at positive, and, and of course, the negative reinforcement is the telling off. You know, or when kids are little, it's sitting them on the naughty chair. For you to really encourage the behavior you want, you want a bucket load of positive reinforcement and very little negative. But what happens in our busy days, what we tend to do when people are doing things that we want them to do, we get on and do our stuff. 
And we actually take, need to take time out of our day to spot good people doing good things and acknowledging that so that we encourage the behavior. Otherwise, what happens, we don't say anything and we just point out when we don't like something in a document or we don't like how people do it and we just come across as being a nag. And, and, and therefore, you know, it's, it's, we're not encouraging the right behavior. Shaping. Now, shaping is, this is a dog being fed a treat. I can see, there we go. Shaping is, um, is a technique, it's a psychological um, term for a technique to again encourage the behavior you want. This is vital for perfectionists. So if you are a perfectionist, you've got to have this in your um, uh, toolbox. Now, shaping works on animals, humans. I often equate this that shaping works on um, dogs, children, and CEOs. But I said that at a conference of CEOs and they didn't like the analogy. So let's just say it works on adults as well. The concept of shaping imagine you've got a puppy and you want to teach it how to sit. If the dog, you say the command sit, if it vaguely gets its bum near the ground, you give it a reward. It's not perfect, but the attempt is great. So what you need to do, you need to encourage the attempt. If you are a perfectionist, the first things out of your mouth are likely to be, no, 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 you don't do it that way. Um, so I give the example, if you've got a child and you're saying to the child, you know, encouraging them, okay, it's your turn, loading the dishwasher is now your job, and you give some basic instructions. Now, you might go into overload instructions, but the child is just going, oh my gosh, there's so many plates on the table, they're not listening, they're just overwhelmed with the task. If the child gets up from the table and just puts things in the dishwasher, it might not be perfect. And I know you beautiful perfectionists have a certain way that things are loaded in dishwashers. If the child goes and stacks the dishwasher, it might be messy. It might not be how you do it. But that is a time to go, well done. Good job. You know, you were really good there at getting up and just doing it as opposed to taking all the plates out and reorganizing it, because that's negative reinforcement and the child is less likely to do it again. So encourage the intent rather than the outcome, but you'll get to the end result a lot quicker if you use shaping. Um, and just from personal experience, if you are delegating cooking, as I say, my kids at 10 and 11 were cooking a meal a week. That include working out what to cook and how to cook it. I suggest um, if you are delegating tasks to younger people or if, even a partner that doesn't cook, just walk away from the kitchen because you will be bombarded with questions like, how do you, what sauce should I put with pasta? Which pan should I use? And if you're not careful, that task comes back to you. It also means you will probably have some pretty horrendous meals in the beginning. Um, my ex-husband, when he, he didn't like cooking, and I didn't like the fact that at his age he couldn't cook, and I walked away from the kitchen, and he made herring pasta with pickled herrings in a tomato sauce. I cannot tell you how bad it was, but um, you know, first attempt, just let him do that. And he learned from his mistake that it was really bad. Um, if we apply this in the workplace in terms of delegating, particularly what I see a lot in the workplace, um, women don't want to overload their staff. They're really worried about overloading their staff because they care. What's really interesting when I interview the staff, the staff go, I care about my boss, she's really overloaded, I would like to help. 
I'd also like to grow as a person and learn some new skills. And I feel like my boss doesn't trust me to do the work. So the woman from that very nature of wanting to care about her staff actually is, is, is damaging the relationship. Daniel Pink, if, if you haven't read it, it's a good book on Drive, which talks about intrinsic motivation, which is what it, it's our inner motivation for doing things. We like autonomy. So we like to be able to do things on our own. Um, we also like um, mastery. We like being able to do it well. Um, and we want to understand the why of what we're doing it. But in the workplace, if you're struggling delegating in the workplace, there's the, also the YouTube clip there, which is just 10 minutes. It's really good to understand so that um, it will help you with delegating. Now, I'm very conscious of time. Um, so we've covered basically delegating. In terms of simplify, for those of you that are perfectionists, there are two, two quotes that I'd love you to use. Um, the first is, good enough is good enough. In this busy workplace, um, good enough is definitely good enough. So that's a great mantra for you in terms of simplifying, or I choose connection over perfection. So it's more important to spend time with family than it is in getting the report right. Um, in terms of dumping tasks, um, what I say here is just try it. Just go, okay, I'm going to not do this task and see what happens. And if your world falls apart, then sure, do the task again. But we spend a lot of time doing tasks we shouldn't do. So just, just give it a go. And finally, in terms of boundaries with your tasks today so with the tasks that you've gone no these are mine I can't delegate or I've simplified them as far as I can and I want to do them work out with your list of tasks what's your priority for the day which of these tasks must you do today and out of your long to-do list which hopefully is shorter because you've delegated simplified up which must you do today and there should only be a handful. Those handful of tasks, three or four tasks, that's the list that you have in front of you. Start with the task that you don't want to do. Get that out of the way. Then complete the others. Because when you've completed your must-dos for the day, you can go home or you probably are at home, but you can turn off your computer because you've done your must-dos for the day. So that's it from me. Um, are there any questions? Wow, Tracy, that was amazing. What an incredible amount of very useful information. Any questions? Uh, ciao for now, Tracy. Have a beautiful time, and we will no doubt touch base between now and the next one as well. Yeah, lovely. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you, everyone. Have a beautiful week.